Assalamu alaikum viewers. Welcome to another episode of Justice Talks, a webinar series, webinar and podcast series organized by Justice for All Canada, dedicated to raising awareness about Justice for All human rights campaigns. I'm Tazeen Hassan, your host today, honored to serve as the advocacy manager at Justice for All Canada. We are deeply committed to advocating against the genocide of indigenous people and the persecution of minorities around the world. Justice for All is currently running several impactful human rights campaigns, encompassing significant issues like Kashmir Action, Save Uyghurs, Sri Lanka Task Force, Rohingya, Save Rohingya, Save India from Fascism, and the Prisoners of Conscience campaign. Today's episode is dedicated to shedding light to our Prisoners of Conscience campaign, a crucial effort aimed at advocating for those unjustly detained. We are honored to have a remarkable guest, Ahmed bin Qasim, with us today, someone whose personal connection to this campaign its urgency, amplifies its urgency and importance. He's the son of two Kashmiri prisoners of conscience whose stories represent the heartbreaking reality faced by almost all Kashmiri civil leadership, civil and political leadership. Welcome, Ahmed, Ahmed bin Qasim. Thank you so much for having me for this very important conversation um, and for having to have this conversation and talk about the important topic of arbitrary detention. I'm glad to do it. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for joining us. Uh, let me tell the details. Ahmed's mother, Asiya Andrabi, a prominent and resilient women leader of the Kashmiri resistance movement since late 1980s, who was arrested multiple times, once with her seven-month-old son and husband as a punishment of her struggle for the Kashmiri uh, freedom. Right now, she's detained arbitrarily in Tihar jail since 2017. We would like to hear about her incarceration and the background and what conditions she's facing there and what about the trial situation with Ahmed, inshallah. Ahmed, our guest today, also brings his father's story to the forefront. Mohammed Qasim Fakto, a distinguished Kashmiri intellectual, scholar, and author of over two dozen books, has faced a daunting journey of 30 years incarceration. Detained in Udampur Jail, Jammu, since 1992, he has been set. He has been. Uh, he has seen decades slip by within prison walls. In a stark example of the Indian regime's tactics, he was briefly released in 1998 only to be tempted with the position of vice chancellor at Kashmir University in a misguided attempt to silence him. His principal refusal, along with his wife, Asiya Andrabi, of a pro-India role in Kashmiri politics resulted in his incarceration. Uh, Mohammed Qasim Fakto has spent a harrowing 30 years in detention. This is a staggering truth that needs our attention, that, that needs world's attention three years more than Nelson Mandela. More surprising is the fact that nobody knows Qasim Fakto and other Nelson Mandelas of Kashmir. He was initially convicted based on a coerced confession under duress and handed a 14 year sentence, yet even after three decades, he remained imprisoned. Ahmed will tell the story as well as discuss the connection of arbitrary detention and colonization and settler colonization of Kashmir. Ahmed is a prolific writer, a podcast host. Podcast is called Kosher Musulman, right? And a student of anthropology. JFA is also honored to have him as an overseas employee. Our topic today is justice denied, arbitrary detention as a settler colonial tool in Kashmir. Let me explain the context. Uh, I will not take uh, much time. Uh, Arbitrary detention to crush dissent is not a new phenomenon in a country recognized as largest democracy in the world. To maintain colonization, India has strategically incarcerated Kashmiri leadership since 1950s. Even individuals like Sheikh Abdullah, who was considered an ally, have fallen victim to this approach. The audacious strategy has not gone unnoticed, with top cadre of senior in Indian intelligence officials brazenly acknowledging it. The head of two top in Indian intelligence agencies, Intelligence Bureau and IB, uh, 
Intelligence Bureau, IB and RAW. A.S. Dulat uh, writes in his book, Kashmir, The Vajpayee Years. He talks candidly about, candidly about the use of Public Safety Act, PSA, revealing that Kashmiri leadership leaders are usually detained for two years, released, and then immediately rearrested at the prison gates. We will talk about uh, the Public Safety Act of the Indian Constitution, which is applied uh, in, mostly in Kashmir. So this law, which is apparently meant to deal with public safety, is essentially used to detain the dissenter for infinite time. Historically, instruments like TADA were employed, but over the past two years, the Indian occupied regime has destroyed to using PSA, Public Safety Act. Moreover, the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act is now being wielded as a tool against journalists, human rights defenders, and both civil and political leaders. This act has been employed not just as a weapon against dissent, but as a means to suffocate voices that challenge the status quo. An Amnesty International report from 2010 echoes the disturbing sentiment of a political of a police official who stated, "We have to keep them out of circulation." Out of circulation is used uh, uh, to denote uh, detention, arbitrary detention. Prominent political figures as Shabir Shah, Yasin Malik, Sayyid Ali Gilani, Ashraf Serai, Asi Andrabi, Qasim Faktu, Altaf Shah, as well as journalists like Asif Sultan, Sajjad Gul, Fahad Shah have all experienced the heavy end of this oppressive approach. Human rights defenders, including Khudram Parvez, have been unjustly confined as fabricated, on fabricated charges, once marked by the deeply unjust accusation of money laundering. So this is these are the conditions, and then uh, Ahmed, uh, I will I will invite you to talk about uh, your parents' incarceration. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me again. Um, when it comes to the imprisonment of my parents or their illegal detention, uh, you already mentioned obviously that. Uh, they are not the only political prisoners in Kashmir. Uh, rather, one of the tools that the Indian state has repeatedly deployed in order to suppress the freedom struggle or the liberation struggle in Kashmir has been arbitrary detention. So my parents happen to be um, two of the thousands of Kashmiri political prisoners who languish in different Indian prisons uh, at the moment. Uh, these prisoners obviously include women, children, students, old people, pretty much everybody from Kashmir, all uh, sections of the society. So my father, uh, Dr. Mohammed Qasim, uh, also known as Ashok Hussain Faktu, has been in prison since 1993. And that was when he was first uh, jailed. Um, right in the second year of his marriage with my mother. And in the three decades of their marriage, they have been together only for um, two and a half years or so. Uh, because in 1993, my father was jailed along with my mother and my infant brother, Muhammad, who was an infant at that time. And he was jailed and that made him the youngest Kashmiri political prisoner uh, at that moment. He was a few months old. Um, and he was still breastfeeding. And literally, did he know that he would be the son, he would eventually grow to be the son of Kashmir's longest serving uh, political prisoner. So they were jailed together. And all of them, my mother and my father, they were subjected to a year long interrogation and questioning. And this was called third degree interrogation, where they would use all kinds of um, um, unspeakable torture. Uh, in order to make the Kashmiri either share information with him or to give up their participation in the resistance movement. And some of the methods of the torture that they used um, are simply uh, difficult to describe in terms of uh, the things that they would do to uh, tarnish your sense of any sense of dignity. And whenever they would torture my father, they would make my mother sit uh, in the same room uh, and in the words of my mother, they would make her watch all of it. And many a times they would tell my mother that you should now wait goodbye to him because he's not going to live for long. 
Um, so that is what they would do. And my infant brother used to be in his cell all alone while he was a few months old, while all of this was happening. And then eventually uh, my mother and my brother, they were released. And both my mother and my father were part of the liberation struggle. So it was not like my mother was being oppressed or persecuted because of her connection with my father. It was not the case. Rather, she was her own person who was also participating in the liberation struggle. And rather, the reason why they got married in the first place was because both of them were part of the resistance movement. And then they were released um, and they lived in hideouts. Uh, for the next years, but father was not released. He was kept in detention and he was booked under the PSA, the Public Safety Act that you spoke about when he was first detained because there was nothing else, uh, so to speak, against him. Uh, so PSA has been used by the Indian state, as we know, and gives them the powers to detain any Kashmiri for up to two years without having to provide grounds uh, for the arrest, without having to give the Kashmiri the right to trial, so to speak, or without even have to, having to tell the family or the person himself or herself as to why he's in prison in the first place. Um, so many a times, so the Indian state has, you know, um, more than 95% uh, of the use of the PSA happened in Kashmir um, ever since the PSA has become law, so to speak. So it was basically designed and constructed as a law that would be used fundamentally and primarily in Kashmir, also in northeastern parts of India where other uh, movements for rights um, right now exist. So my mother then, she was outside and my father, he continued to be in prison. And eventually he was forced to make a sign a blank paper uh, while he was under duress. Um, they gave him a blank paper and they told him to sign it. Um, and my father, he, I remember him telling me, he said, at that point, the torture had become so unbearable that I told my uh, torturers, the, basically the intelligence officials of the IB and the RAW and the Home Ministry, I told them that even if they want him to confess to assassinating Gandhi, he would do that just so they could stop the torture. So they gave him the blank paper and he was made to sign that. And then on the basis of that blank paper, they sentenced him to life uh, imprisonment. And initially, uh, this imprisonment was set to 14 years of imprisonment. Uh, but even so, um, in after completing seven or eight years of his imprisonment, um, the court actually, the Tada court that you mentioned, uh, actually overturned uh, the uh, imprisonment decision and acquitted him uh, because there was nothing against him and this uh, confessional statement did not hold uh, the weight because it's not admissible as proper evidence uh, but um, they overturned the decision and he was set free and that is when I was born and he remained outside for a few months but what they expected basically was that they expected that after seven years of imprisonment he would have learned the lesson so to speak, and he would no longer talk and he would stay silent. And this is what they have done with many Kashmiris. Uh, they have forced them into silence, so to speak. Uh, but that did not happen because he started writing and he started speaking. And when they spoke to him and expected that he would perhaps now start working with them in some capacity, uh, initially they offered him that he should take part in the pro-India colonial electoral politics in Kashmir, which he denied. And then they said that because he was a man of uh, knowledge, so to speak, if he doesn't want to take part in electoral politics, he could at least uh, act as an academician in government university, Kashmir University, which he denied as well, because then you have to act as a mercenary mind, basically, when you enter into these structures, these, this system. So then they imprisoned him again, uh, and he has been in prison ever since that day. And I don't have any memories of seeing him outside prison. Uh, because from where my memories start, he was always in prison. And I remember I used to ask my mother why he's in prison. And initially, as a child, you cannot make sense of why your father is in jail. Uh, and I grew up in hideouts, and I remember I used to ask my mother why he's in prison. 
and she would tell me for the first few years of my life that he was in jail for not doing his homework uh, because that's the only thing that would make sense uh, to a child um, it's it's not in the natural instinct of the child to think that their father would be away from them they expect them to be there and then prison is the last place you expect your father to be in so something had to be told and i know many other kashmiris and i say this story by no means is exceptional so i know other kashmiri children who growing up were told that their fathers had gone for hajj um, and that hajj never ended because they were actually in prison or they had been extrajudicially murdered so all kinds of stories you can uh, hear from Kashmiri children about what they were told about their father. Some were told that they, they're overseas working. I was told that my father was jailed for not doing his homework. And then one day I remember distinctly, I skipped my homework just so I could be with my father. And when that did not happen, I confronted my mother. I told her, you told me that he's in prison for not doing his homework. So why didn't it happen to me? And then my brother, because he's seven years older than me, so he had seen things already. He was there. He was an infant when father was first jailed. And then I was an infant when he was jailed for the second time. So he knew. So he's the one who used to talk to me and make me understand. And then in the year 2004 or five, if I'm not mistaken, when I was three or four years old, uh, mother was arrested for the first time. Uh, because she protested against the exploitation, the sexual exploitation of Kashmiri women that the state was both sanctioning and leading. Basically, the Indian bureaucrats and officials were involved in it. It was a huge uh, sex scandal that took place in Kashmir in 2005-06. When she protested against it, um, she was jailed. So the people who perpetrated sexual, ex sexual exploitation of women, they were not jailed. The woman who uh, led the movement against it, she was jailed because the victims of sexual abuse had come to her. So she was jailed and that was very difficult because um, in the absence of father, she had become everything for me in terms of, she was the father, she was the mother, she was the one who was compassionate, but she was the one who disciplined me as well. So she had basically tried to fill that void. And then she was jailed. And that was the first time I really felt like there was no sense of family because because of her I was still able to kind of come to terms with father's imprisonment and then we used to live with our uncles and other people um, and mother she spent more than 12 years of her life in different prisons PSA uh, she has been booked under PSA jailed under PSA for more than 20 times constantly so many times what would happen is that she was jailed under PSA and then she would stay in prison for one or two years and then her PSA would be quashed, quashed as in um, ended, so to speak. And then she was supposed to go free. But then the moment they would take her out of prison and she would leave the prison premises, the state authorities would bring in another PSA order and take her back into prison. So this was a cycle. So many a times, even when her PSA was quashed, we would know that she's not coming home. So we would just stay outside, uh, wave our hands and see her. And before she even got outside, they used to bring another order and say, we're going to keep you in prison again. So that's how it has been. Father has been in prison for uh, more than 29 years. He completed 30 years of imprisonment this February, this year. And mother, she's been in prison for 12 to 13 years of her life. And as I said, their stories by no means are exceptional. There are many other Kashmiris who would tell you similar stories. Really, it should be a very sensitive topic emotionally for you. I can understand, Ahmed, and thank you for sharing all these things. And this is not happening just with your parents. Make it clear. It, it is happening with the, almost all Kashmiri leadership, civil, political leadership, to crush the dissent, actually, to crush the... Yeah, yeah. So Absolutely. Heard... Yeah, please go it's ahead. It's by no means uh, exclusive to, to my parents. So, for example, my mother, she's not the only female political prisoner we have. Uh, we have uh, more than, um, in, to my knowledge, 10 Kashmiri political, female political prisoners who are in different jails. Uh, some of them are in the state of Jammu and Kashmir and some are in different prisons across India. So this, uh, before I go ahead, this 
this point itself. So India has different ways of punishing people. So if you're jailed and you're placed in Kashmir when you're jailed, that's still somewhat lenient, right? So the Indian state really is not going harsh. And when they jail you in Kashmir, this is how they work with the psychology of these Kashmiri people who are part of the resistance. It kind of makes you fear that if you do something while you are in prison um, that the state does not like, if somebody speaks for you outside or so you create some noise or the Indian state is bothered in your case by you know activists abroad or anything basically, any form of pressure, then you would be moved outside Kashmir and sent to Delhi, Udhampur, uh, Ranchi, um, or even to southern parts of India, jails. Now, that is way more difficult because now you're in a land where you basically don't know anybody. And it's not just the police officials that are hostile to Kashmiri political prisoners. And this is extremely important that when it comes to Kashmiri Muslim political prisoners, it's not just the jail officials or the state authorities that are hostile. Many times the police officials have to protect them from the inmates because the inmates also are part of basically the Indian social fabric, which is in these days constituted by anti-Muslim animus and hatred. And that hatred is magnified in the case of the Kashmiri Muslim, because Kashmiri Muslim see, is seen as this archetypal bad Muslim who has to be you know, disciplined and, and punished for basically spoiling even the Indian Muslims, right? So many a times the Indian Muslims, it's assumed that they learn things from Kashmiri Muslims. They learned how to become bad Muslims through Kashmiri Muslims. So the parents, by my parents by no means are the only political prisoners. Our entire uh, resistance leadership is in prison. My father is one story. There's another Kashmiri political prisoner. His name is Gulam Khatir, but He's been in prison for more than 26, 27 years of his life. So he was jailed also in 1993 uh, or four, I assume, um, a few years later than father, but he's also been in prison for more than 26 years. His wife passed away while he was in prison. His mother passed away while he was in prison. He was not allowed to attend a funeral or to take part in the funeral procession. And she was not allowed to visit him when she was on her deathbed. And his wife single-handedly raised his children. So there are many such stories where Kashmiris have been in prison for more than you know, two decades of their life. Some of them even have been released after two decades. We had a case of three Kashmiris who were released after 20 years of imprisonment. And the court said that their imprisonment was baseless when they were released. So where do all these 20 years go of life? This is not justice. I mean, the fact that they're released it's not justice and we can come to the impossibility of justice under colonial rule but even by you know elementary standards if you release somebody after 20 years of destroying their life and breaking apart homes and families there's no justice in that so yeah so you mentioned two major things uh, one, one of them is uh, uh, placing kashmiri prisoners out of kashmir and this has been a practice of Indian uh, Indian regime that uh, they are mostly they are placing Kashmiri prisoners out of India. Most of uh, the, and the most of the detainees they arrested after uh, the revocation of autonomy in on fifth of August nineteen uh, sorry 20, 2019. They are placing them uh, in Tihar in uh, Tihar jail or in uh, even even before that uh, India was employing that Shabir Shah was incarcerated in. Uh, Tehar jail. Yasin Malik is uh, incarcerated there. Your own uh, mother was incarcerated because before 2019, uh, former political prisoners told me, actually Kashmiri prisoners told me that jail doctors are more hostile than jail staff. And uh, yeah. so, so uh, what about their medical treatment? Would you would you uh, illustrate something some uh, from your mother's uh, mother's observations? from your mother's uh, story, how they are treating medically uh, in the jail clinics or hospitals. We, we see that two of them died, actually. Ashraf Sarai and uh, uh, Altaf, Altaf Shah died in prison. And Amnesty International and Justice for All has been campaigning to move Kashmiri prisoner, prisons during the COVID-19 period to Kashmir, or, or at least move them to house arrest 
instead of they are political prisoners they could be they are not escaping kashmir they 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 could be uh, moved house that is like sir sayed ali gilani but indian uh, indian government is not paying any heed to such requests of uh, global human rights organizations so basically uh, from your mother's experience we want to hear how she is facing the the inhuman conditions like uh, not being treated properly by medical uh, medical staff i mean absolutely what you have heard uh, from other kashmiri prisoners uh, that's absolutely true so one of the uh, associates of mother who is right now in tahar jail with mother uh, she is in her 30s uh, fahmida and she is bedridden she cannot walk without a wheelchair and she needs assistance now to walk keep in mind she is in her 30s and i know her because she raised me and in the absence of when mother used to be detained she's the she was the one who was there for us for our family for me and my brother and she cannot walk is something very uh it's very uh difficult for me and uh, those of for her family first of all those who know her because she was one of the most proactive people we know in her in our lives uh, and this is what prison did to her she was not like this when she was jailed she was not like this and now she cannot move and when i see her sometimes and when i hear from her or when i hear uh, about her from mother it's hard to believe that she is the same person but she requires two people to help her walk and she was taken to a hospital after months and months of petitioning and requesting and pleading uh, from her old mother in different courts and so she was taken to a hospital and what happened was that once she was taken to the hospital the hospital staff refused to treat her and they said and i quote in their language and then i would translate they said in atankwadiyon ko yahan mat laya kar which means that don't bring these terrorists to the hospital and obviously because she's a kashmiri muslim woman she has the hijab on she has everything on so it's it's very visible so there's a visibility that you cannot conceal and then there's a particular way of dressing that is associated with mother and her organization so it's very it's very discernible you can observe that fine this is they are from this particular set of people and she was refused they refused to treat her and then the doctor on duty he said i won't treat her and then they asked a couple of other doctors they also refused to treat her and then the most junior doctor saw her and so that is the condition where the police officials had to basically find a doctor in the hospital who would see this kashmiri prisoner we saw this in the case of altaf shah as well uh, this refusal to treat and to be honest let me tell you something medical rights for kashmiris are non existent for kashmiri political prisoners it's a facade so i remember in around time of 2010 my mother was detained in srinagar kashmir uh, under psa and they wanted to shift her to jammu because they said uh, that she is still doing activities while she is in kashmiri prison so there's a formality that before you take a prisoner to any other part of uh, any other state or any other uh, you know away from kashmir basically you have to first subject them to a medical checkup to see if they're fit to travel so they took her to this hospital so that you're taken to a police hospital and when they took her there the doctor saw her and he did the check up and he did the tests and he wrote on the prescription he said i was accompanying mother he said let alone taking her to a distant you know place that is miles away and involves you know long road travel and as and a hot climate because kashmiris are not used to you know hot climate that you find in india otherwise kashmir in terms of weather is very different which in many ways is a political statement as well it's very different from the rest of india so they so the doctor he said you can't take her anywhere take her to the hospital because that's where she should be and we were surprised because we were surprised and that tells you something we don't expect a doctor who is working in a police hospital to actually even say such a thing that was not our experience we had seen doctors overseeing torture and suggesting better torture techniques in in the case of my father um as opposed to saying that they should be hospitalized so so fine they took her back to the 
um, police station where they were keeping her. And the next day, she was brought to the hospital again, police hospital. And the doctor on duty, he saw my mother and without even, you know, touching her or checking anything, he took the prescription and he said, to my eyes, you look fit to travel. And keep in mind that the only part of mother that he could see was mother's eyes. And he said, you're fit to travel. And next day, rather on the same day, on the, in, the, in the evening, they transported her. So medical rights for Kashmir is right now, mother, she suffers from acute asthma. She suffers from arthritis. She suffers from respiratory problems. Um, she suffers from multiple ailments. And recently she was diagnosed with diabetes. And when she was diagnosed with diabetes, we requested, we told the prison authorities that, you know, there are a set of medicines that she requires now. She's a diabetic patient. And she requires particular kinds of foods. She cannot eat potatoes and pulses now. That are the only things available in prison. So everything was rejected. You're not allowed medicine. You're not allowed foods. We, say, we told them that we don't want you preparing things for her. We would pay or we would send food items for her. Everything was rejected. And with Fahmi, the, the case is same. You know, the doctor, when she was taken to the, the hospital, the hospital in prison, the dispensary in prison, the junior doctor there, he stated that he can't do anything. She requires urgent surgery. And we said, fine, we'll get her surgery. They said, we'll take her to the hospital for the surgery and bring, bring her back to the prison the next day. And she's not going for the surgery because she knows you can't recover in prison. So if you go for a back surgery and then the next day you're brought back to a prison where basically you're not even allowed any ma basic medical care, there's no possibility of recovery. So basically medical rights for Kashmiri prisoners are non-existent. And this is not random. Mm. And this is systematic. So Kashmiri like political prisoners are denied medical rights in order to systematically push them to the brink of death. In the case of Sehrai Saab, Ashraf Sehrai, who you mentioned, he was in Udhampur jail, same as my father, and they shared a cell. And when I spoke to my father after the passing away of Sehrai Saab, which was effectively a custodial murder, he said for months and months, it was not a case of a week, for a few weeks, for months Sehrai was severely ill, and they did not take him to any hospital. And when he was on the verge of death, they locate, relocated him to a hospital just so nobody says he died in prison. That's, that's what they did. And that's what they plan to do with pretty much every Kashmiri. Either they would hang them or they would basically push them to the verge of death and then say it's a natural death. You, can't, you don't die naturally in a prison. That's not a natural death in the first place. Nobody dies in prison. Right? You're in, in a set of conditions where everything's working against you. And then you die. That's not a natural death in the first place. Uh, but yeah, that's how it is. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed, uh, for sharing this, because these are the things we often uh, hear about uh, the incarceration, detention of 10 years, 20 years. But we don't, uh, we don't pay attention to these details. I mean, what they are suffering, the inhuman conditions inside the jail. You mentioned the uh, medical conditions. What about the legal representation? Can you briefly uh, tell us that uh, how how much legal represent? I mean, this right, legal rights, uh, they, they are because I, I remember that in 2021, some uh, students, medical students or engineering students from Agra were detained on the charges that they celebrated uh, Pakistani victory, and nobody in Agra was uh, uh, was uh, uh, ready to legally represent them. No lawyer there. So uh, I don't know out of fear or out of hatred. What was the case? I remember one Indian politician said that they should be, Kashmiris should be skinned alive. They, their uh, Pakistani blood uh, runs into their veins. I, I, I remember this, I mean, full of hate. Uh, and what, I don't know how they, their followers uh, cope with this hatred, this uh, hateful, these hateful remarks. So tell us about the legal representation. Are they getting this right of legally represented in the court? So there are multiple facets to this uh, question. Uh, the first thing is that uh, right now it's very difficult to get a lawyer for a Kashmiri political prisoner. And Kashmiri lawyers don't fight your case anymore. 
So that's passed. So all of the Kashmir political prisoners, almost all of them, none of them have a Kashmiri lawyer. Because Kashmiri lawyers would be jailed if they fought their cases. And we saw this in the case of Mia uh, Kayum Sahab, who was jailed uh, basically because he's a lawyer who is sympathetic to the self-determination movement and he used to fight the case of Kashmir political prisoners, my father included. Um, so Kashmir lawyers, because of fear, obviously, um, they are not willing to take up your case. As for the Indian lawyers, now that's an interesting case because our lawyer, for example, and I'm sharing this with you, um, he told us that the imprisonment, and this is a senior lawyer telling us this, he said that the imprisonment of mother is a political imprisonment. And there's nothing they should, we should expect. And he said this in very clear, blunt terms. Uh, because we, were we told him that what relief does he think is possible. He said there would be relief only when Amit Shah wants it. So here's a lawyer who is basically accepting that he can't do anything. Uh, because the detention is primarily subject to the will of the Indian state. And the, the law is not... Yeah, same as the yeah, it, daughter. They say that this yeah, is political. Absolutely. And, yeah. So, so when it comes to uh, legal representation, therefore, there's this one element, first of all, of the difficulty of getting a lawyer. And then when the, you finally have a lawyer, the futility of having it. Um, but then there's also another element to it, which is not talked about much uh, most of the times. And before I talk about that, it's also pertinent to mention here that when father was subject to life imprisonment first, it was set to 14 years. And when he completed 14 years of imprisonment in 2008, this is just to give you, give you an idea of how Indian judiciary works when it comes to Kashmir political prisoners. Um, in 2008, when we were expecting that he would be released because 14 years was the definition of life imprisonment in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, in the jail, ma in jail manual of the state. Uh, the court said that, no, it was not 14 years that we meant, it was 20 years of imprisonment. And we said, okay, another six years. And then when he completed his 20 years of imprisonment, we moved to the court seeking his release. And Mia Kayum, who I mentioned before, he was in the courtroom. I was outside the courtroom expecting that you know, any time father might they might say their father is free to go home. Though deep down, Eid after Eid, waiting for him to come back, my heart had kind of gotten accustomed to hearing no. Uh, so the judge, the presiding judge, uh, he said, and he said that life imprisonment means imprisonment till death. So there is no question of years. He's going to stay in prison until he dies. That's the definition and interpretation of life imprisonment in his case. And that was basically this interpretation of life imprisonment was done for the first time in father's case. And then using now using his case as a legal precedent, they're going to use it for a range of other Kashmiri political prisoners. That life imprisonment means imprisonment till death. And let me also tell you how incentives and how Kashmiri political prisoners are seen as trophies by Indian bureaucrats and our personnel. We know this in the case of Indian Army, uh, people who, you know, kill Kashmiris and then they get uh, promotions based on that, how many Kashmiris you have killed. But it's not just Army that this phenomenon is restricted to. When this judge basically passed this uh, judgment, after that he was made, uh, the uh, basically he was promoted and made the most senior judge of the entire region of Jammu and Kashmir and Himachal Pradesh because of this judgment. So it's not just the army people who are rewarded when they punish Kashmir. It's also, it's also the bureaucrats, it's also the judges. As for the legal representation, it's also, and this is the point that I want to emphasize, when the Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and all of the organizations, they talk about right to trial, and they talk about right to lawyer and they talk about all of these things. It's important, obviously, as you know, mechanisms of redressal and everything. But when it comes to the case, case of Kashmir political prisoners, we have to understand we're talking about, we're talking in a colonial context. And we're talking in the context of occupation. And this is something that we should not forget. And I say this because let's say take the example of the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, the UAPA. 
which mm-hmm. now is used more often than the PSA or any other uh, basically uh, act is. Uh, PSA was used when the UAPA was not applicable in Kashmir uh, much. Now everything that happens happens under the UAPA. Um, my mother, she is detained under the UAPA. Our house was seized under the UAPA. Every Kashmiri who is jailed is jailed under the UAPA. And there's a reason why. But now, one of the clauses uh, in the UAPA states when it's defining what constitutes terrorism, right? It says terrorism is basically any act or speech that creates disaffection against the state of India or questions the territorial integrity or sovereignty of the Indian state. Now, there are two things. Disaffection and threatening the territorial sovereignty of the state. Now, if you think about the Kashmiri liberation struggle, first of all, what can a colonized people feel for the colonizer except for disaffection and hatred and repulsiveness? And they express that. The liberation struggle is a manifestation of the rejection, right? So obviously... When it comes to a Kashmiri political prisoner who is seeking to liberate Kashmir from Indian occupation, he is in many ways questioning India's sovereignty over Kashmir. And he is questioning India's territorial sovereignty because for the Indian state, the occupation of Kashmir is constitutive of its sovereignty. So part of Indian sovereignty is its possession of Kashmir. And if you're questioning that, by the definition of the UAPA, you are doing something that's illegal. That's true. There's no point denying that. There's no point saying that uh, the detention of these Kashmiris is illegal. It's illegal by the standards of international law, not by the standards of the Indian domestic legal framework. And that's something very important for us to keep in mind, because when outside Kashmir organizations talk about giving Kashmiris right to free trial, you have to ask trial under what law? This is a question that's not talked about. Under what juridical framework are these Kashmiris being tried? Because if they are tried under the Indian juridical framework, Indian legal framework, that even if they're given trials and you know they're given lawyers, they're given everything, they're still going to stay behind bars. It's not going to make any difference. And we saw this in the case of Yasin Malik, for example. You tell me that when a Kashmiri political prisoner is brought into the court and he's asked, do you believe that Kashmir is a part of India? And he says no. And it's asked, are you working to basically separate Kashmir from India? And he would say yes. I mean, that's reason enough for the state to uh, you know, prosecute him under the law. There's nothing illegal about it. It's everything immoral about it. But there's nothing illegal about it, so to speak, when it comes to Indian legal framework. So one corrective that has to be done is that when Kashmiri uh, political prisoners are talked about and law is talked about, it's important to remember that lawlessness is not the problem. It's not as if there is no law. There the is illegal a lot laws, of law. actually the laws itself, themselves exactly. are illegal. The laws themselves are oppressive. So law is not going to solve anything. So, so basically, speak. So the uh, detention... an LST or yeah. someone said that uh, the PSA is a lawless law. They, they yeah, it that's the paradox. Yes. Okay. Moving forward, Ahmed, uh, I would like to divert um, uh, the discussion a little. Uh, India has been arbitrarily detaining Kashmiris uh, since uh, since fifties. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah, who was the biggest ally of uh, India, who actually uh, supported India's uh, uh, annexation of Kashmir, who he, he was incarcerated. And then in 1990s, we saw lo- loads and loads of people disappeared and then loads of loads of political leadership, civil leadership incarcerated. Then after the third phase start, starts from uh, the revocation of the autonomy in August of 2019. So basically, I would like you to briefly, because we have a short time now, uh, briefly uh, tell us about uh, the India's objective and uh, how how you can connect uh, the arbitrary detention, this inhuman arbitrary detention, as you mentioned, with the settler colonization of Kashmir. I mean, uh, how India is getting, what India is getting with this uh, these tactics of arbitrary detention, how they are using this as a tool of settler colonization. So 
basically when you talk about settler colonization so we have to also keep in mind that uh, when we talk about kashmir these days all of it is traced back to the rise of the bjp um, and that is understandable to some degree because of the particular manifestation of the visibility of the violence it's become very pervasive right but it's also important to remember that we cannot reduce it to the rise of bjp's power so when it comes to kashmir the occupation is seven decades long it started in the 19 in the year 1947 1948 it did not start in 2014 did not start in 2019 uh, there was a movement for self determination and freedom that is seven seven decades old now and even goes back to you know when it comes to resisting the dogra and the sikh empires but staying on the point so kashmiris see these as phases right they see these transformations as phases of the occupation and phases of the phases or phases of the occupation so military occupation when you talk about military occupation there's always a sense of temporariness when you talk about military occupation in the sense that any colonial power when it is relying on military power to keep a territory in its hold kind of knows that it can't do that forever you know it can't basically keep control of a land through military rule forever it's most it's it's counterproductive it's co- it's not cost effective it involves a lot of cost and there's always the fear that you know it might all unravel and the occupation might end so the transition to settler colonization really reflects indian state's desire to achieve permanence for its existence in kashmir it is through settler colonization that india truly makes kashmir its own it is through settler colonization that it's going to be able to do that uh, by changing the very nature and constitution of what kashmir is and who a kashmiri is and what kashmir is made of so all of these things military occupation cannot really transform that because the military is in the barracks they come out they oppress they shoot they kill people they do everything but they're still in the uniform you look at them and you know that they are outsiders they, they don't belong they are not the people they are not the local people and that is what the indian state seeks to change now now where does arbitrary detention fall in all of this is that arbitrary detention is one of the ways in which the indian state has kept the population in check it's one of the ways in which the indian state has uh, repressed the possibility of a resistance now when it comes to if you know anybody who knows kashmir knows that it's not just uh, the kashmiri pro freedom fighters who are out there fighting kashmiris have led agitations the people the unarmed people have led agitations in 2008 in the 90s in 2010 in 2016 uh, many a times and we used to see mass detentions uh, that time so right now kashmiris through arbitrary detention the indian state has created this atmosphere of fear where any kashmiri who has had an fir against them in the past in 2008 or 10 or 16 all of them have been told look we are going to reopen the firs if you if you talk if you do anything and we are going to put you back in prison and nowadays what happens is that they don't just put you in prison we talked about this they send you to places miles away from your home and kashmiris not all most of the kashmiris cannot afford traveling to see their loved ones in you know prisons in delhi or in uh, ranchi or in uh, agra right so what they do is that there's a fear that if you talk we are going to put you in prison and we are not only going to put you in prison but we are going to expel your brother who is an employee we are going to you know Under ask your brother you yeah you we are going to ask your brother to come to the police station pretty much every week we are going to pick up your old father when he is going to the mosque and pester him so basically what they are doing is that they are making kashmiris or part of the resistance movement feel that not only are they going to uh, you know experience difficulties and oppression themselves but because of them all of their family is going to experience the same thing right your the distant relatives are going to experience it too so basically arbitrary detention when it comes to you know arbitrary arbitrary detention at mass level is simply indian state 
removing those people from Kashmir who they feel can create problems for the Indian, Indian state and its project of occupation. It's taking them out, isolating them, secluding them so that they don't, uh, quote unquote, uh, ruin other Kashmiris or mislead other Kashmiris. So kind of taking out the bad apples, so to speak. And, and that is why the Indian state has jailed pretty much all of Kashmiri leadership as well. Because there is no one in Kashmir right now who the people can turn to and expect that this person is going to tell us where we go from here. There's not a single soul in Kashmir. Every so, single person who Kashmiris look up to as, as, a, as a leader or as somebody who is going to think for them, guide them, lead them through this you know, onslaught that is there right now, there is literally nobody. So through Every arbitrary detention, place. yeah. So through arbitrary detention, they are basically, uh, they are basically depriving. They, they actually have deprived Kashmiris from and their the leadership, people. civil, intellectual, people, yeah. political leadership. They have deprived for 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 decades actually, not not for, for now decades. but for decades. Yeah. Just to then, add, uh, just to add. yeah. Please go ahead. I just add one quick point. Um, so basically, what used to happen in the past was that. The, so when it comes to the resistance leadership, there there's a hierarchy. There were people at the top, and there were people working under them. There were different levels of you know move, uh, the organization, so to speak. And what used to happen in the past, for the most part, was that let's say August fifteenth is around, and the Indian state knows that Kashmiris they don't feel any belonging towards India. They see it as a colonizing power, so they they, they have no reason to celebrate it, right? So what they would do instead is that they would you know, protest against the Indian state on this day. And what they would do is that they would retain all the top tier leadership, right? And put them behind bars when the August 15th was around or when the elections, quote unquote, elections were around. What they have done now is that they haven't just jailed the people at the top, right? the faces. They have jailed, if you look at it as a pyramid, they have jailed, they've covered all of it. So a person at the level of, let's say, a lane or a colony or a society, I don't know, in our language, you say mohalla, I don't know how to translate it into English, a neighborhood, so to speak. So even a person who had an influence on a neighborhood, right? let's say a person who people used to listen to in a neighborhood, he was the imam of the mosque or he was head of the neighborhood committee. And during times of state repression, he would organize people and he would organize. Everyone has been jailed. From top to bottom. So there's nobody outside who can mobilize people, who can talk to people. You can't talk anymore. So that is what the Indian state has done. It has basically created a wedge between those people who used to guide resistance movement and the masses in general, who used to come yeah. out and follow these people. Okay. Uh, Ahmed, thank you for sharing uh, all these things. And... Um... My next question would be about, uh, we are talking about settler colonization. In the, that definitely Kashmir has entered uh, in a new phase of settler colonization. Experts, global experts are almost unanimously uh, agreed that settler colonization leads to genocide. Uh, and and if a genocidal warning is already issued for Kashmir. So how do you see things, how India is, and, and then uh, as you mentioned that uh, before before this uh, before any occasion like this as uh, we see in the g20 before g20 thousands of kashmiri boys were detained and uh, the shopkeepers uh, get threats uh, from uh, from the regime so how cons considering this that uh, settler colonization actually leads to the genocide and uh, India is doing the same as uh, uh, done in North America, in Australia, in New Zealand, what uh, the white people has done with the indigenous nations, that uh, settling millions and millions of people uh, in Kashmir after the revocation, they have, they have uh, distributed uh, domiciles. They have distributed domiciles like, uh, what, what should we say, 4.1 million domiciles were distributed yeah. uh, to ex-Indian army personals and their families. They are, they are already influential people. So this will definitely change the fabric of the Kashmiri society. And we see the consequences. Uh, after the revocation, 10,000 Kashmiri girls have been abducted, according to the recent uh, report by 
Voice of America, and the data given that is based on the data given by the Indian state, that 10,000 or, or uh, around 10,000 Kashmiri girls have been abducted. How can 10,000 Kashmiri girls can be abducted in the presence of so many arm, army troops? On every corner, there is a checkpoint, as we know, as the world knows that. So, how will you? Uh, how will you? Uh, I mean, what are the underlying objectives that India seeks to attain through all these disenfranchisement and the settler colonialism and the genocide? Yeah. So, so basically, there's a very uh, interesting scholar um, of settler colonial studies uh, called uh, Lorenzo Verishini. And he's basically the pioneer of settler colonial studies along with Patrick Wolf. And he said something very interesting to me one day we were talking and he said that he sees two models of uh, domination uh, of the Indian state in Kashmir. One is based on the logic of repro reproduction and another is based on the logic of elimination. And he said, he gave two very interesting examples and I would just like to quote him here. He said that you can think of the colonizer as somebody who comes to a land and, you know, by dint of force occupies it. And then he makes a big palace for himself at the top of the mountain. And he goes and lives in their palace, in that palace. His children live in that palace. And every morning he comes out, he opens the window and he, he sees the plantation and he sees the indigenous people working for him. And he's happy. The indigenous people are there, they're working. His children are going to grow as colonizers. He's going to die. His children are going to be in the same palace. Their children are going to be in the plantation. So it's a relationship of reproduction, right? The, the logic here is not of exterminating the people, but it's of reproducing this relationship of domination. And this is something that the Indian state, if you think about it with small, you know, there are, you can't just copy it and paste it here. There are slight variations, but... That's been the predominant story of Kashmir before uh, 2019. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that the Jammu massacre took place in 1947. We already saw wide scale uh, elimination there. But this has been the predominant story where the Indian state has not really uh, tried to exterminate Kashmiri population whole scale, but it has tried to reproduce this, this relationship of domination between Kashmiris and India, where Kashmiris would be allowed let's say, to have their own flag, to have this or that particular right, so long as they are subjected to the sovereign power of the Indian state, right? Within this overarching power structure, they were allowed, uh, you know, some measure of autonomy, which was always uh, curtailed by this broader subjection to Indian power. And then he said that there is another possibility that a colonizer comes and instead of making a palace for himself, he just makes a small cottage and he tells the indigenous population, look, I don't want you to be here. This is my land. I want you to go away and leave. And then he basically does everything that he has to expel those people. And when he opens the window in the morning, he just doesn't want to see anybody. He doesn't want to see the indigenous population at all. Well, and he just wants it. Yes, he just wants to see similar cottages of people who belong to his community. And he wants them, his own people, to be working in the plantations together. Right? So the idea here is that there's a logic of elimination. And that is what we're seeing in the context of Kashmir right now. That the Indian state is tired of the possibility that their whole project of occupying Kashmir might dis get dismantled because of some resistance that might you know come up anytime and we have had these moments in the 90s in 2010 in 2016 where the where the indian state's political writ on ground in kashmir was pretty much uh, non existent right so therefore what they're trying to do now is to transform kashmir into something else is to transform uh, you know, what it means to be a Kashmiri. So I always say this, that for the Indian state, there are two approaches in uh, when it comes to India's um, engagement with Kashmir. One approach is the approach that we're seeing right now, which is that the only good Kashmiri Muslim is a dead Kashmiri Muslim. That's the only good Kashmiri Muslim, right? And another approach that we have is kill the Kashmiri Muslim in him and save the man. 
basically to say that you kill everything that makes Kashmiri Muslim a Kashmiri Muslim and then you say that he's not a Kashmiri Muslim anymore, he's an Indian. So you basically erase Kashmiri people not through exterminating them, but through denying them their sense of self, right? And this is something that... Assimilation. Yes, assimilation. You expel them through assimilating them into yourself. And this is something that, you know, Kashmir scholars like Hafsa Kanjwal and also Lorenzo Verishini, he says something interesting. He says that before 2019, what the dominant discourse in India was that there is Kashmir and it's a separate place and there is India and Kashmir belongs to India, right? So there was a recognition, first of all, of Kashmir being different. And then there was a claim over it, right? It is there, but it's ours, right? It's going to stay with us. What's happening now is a denial. What he says now, what we have is an isopolity, which is to say that now they don't say that there is Kashmir and there is India and Kashmir belongs to India. Say Kashmir, Kashmir is, is India. India. Now they want to say that Kashmir is India. There is no Kashmir. There is India, right? So India. whatever it is, so Kashmir. So this, these are two modes of domination, basically. Uh, that you see in the context of 2019, what what's happening recently. So do you think that India not, will succeed? Yeah. Do you think that India will succeed in this narrative? Let me let me tell I, you a very interesting interesting anecdote. When yeah. G20 was announced that G20 G20 was announced that India is getting the presidency of G20, uh, there was a news that uh, G20 will be held in Kashmir. And if you ask uh, Google, where uh, is is it going to be held? Uh, the G20 to 2023. Google will answer you that G20 is being held in Kashmir, not in India. So one of one of our Kashmiri journalists I was talking, he was in Ankara. He said that uh, G20 should be called G21 now because Kashmir is declared a country now. <laughs> so do you think that uh, India will India is going to succeed? And what my next question is because we have to uh, we have to wind up now. So I'm asking the question uh, at the end. Usually people, even in the Muslim world, I've heard this narrative that, okay, we should leave uh, the status quo as it is. We should, we, should, uh, uh, we should declare the line of control as the international border. And Kashmiris will be better if, if, they, if they make uh, reconciliation with India. Uh, and the, on the Pakistani side, they will reconcile with Pakistan. And on the Indian side, they will. Many of our people say that if if we do that, the the problem will solve. So these two questions, I would like you to answer at the end. So I would uh, answer the latter question first, and then the question about whether I think it's going to succeed or not. So the first thing is that uh, it doesn't matter what, and I, I'm being a bit, I'm being somewhat blunt here. It doesn't matter what uh, people think. Um, how this thing should be solved. What matters is what the aspirations of Kashmiris are. So we have had, and this is not just hypothetical what you're asking, we have had many moments in the last seven decades where this was a very tangible possibility. Uh, the Basically the normalization of the status quo and the institutionalization of it and the acceptance of it as the destiny. And this was offered to Kashmiris on multiple occasions. And as an idea, it was rejected. As an end goal, it was rejected. It's one thing to say that, you know, there should be more, more mobility between uh, what's called Azad Kashmir and occupied Kashmir, and they should be allowed to move and everything. No Kashmiri would contest that. No Kashmiri would say that this should not happen. But no Kashmiri ever will accept, after all this long struggle, that what we were struggling for is basically a greater autonomy within the existing Indian uh, the relationship that we are in with the Indian nation state. So I always say this, it's not a question of what the Indian state does with its power in Kashmir. It's not a question of how it treats Kashmiris. It's a question of the fact that the Indian state has power over the lives of Kashmiris, regardless of what it does with this power. So for Kashmiris, the acceptance of status quo as inevitable as the only possible thing that can be there now is basically telling them that everything they have been struggling for is it's futile it was it was meaningless so 
Kashmiris, Alhamdulillah, are people who are well read. So they have they have read histories of colonial struggles. They know it's not it's not an event. So liberation is not an event. It's a process. It's a long. Sometimes it takes you know, God knows how much time it's going to take. So they know that this is how it's going to be. And right now we are seeing a moment in Kashmir's history where every, when anyone looks at Kashmir, they're like, why isn't resistance happening? Why aren't people out on the streets? But they don't understand the same people were out on the streets in 2016. Nothing has changed in the people. It's a particular point of time in Kashmir's history where people maybe are absorbing the pressure. right? Their resistance right now is simply that they are absorbing the pressure and they are existing. That's their way of resisting right now. And if you ask any Kashmiri in the privacy of your room or home, that what do you think about Kashmir's relationship with India? Their answer would be no different than what it was a few years back. It, rather, it, it's gotten aggravated now. So, no, um, I'm obviously not a representative of all Kashmiris, but our streets will tell you that the idea that Kashmir should be given you know, some autonomy within the larger sovereign power of the Indian state is unacceptable to them. This was offered to them again and again. During Vajpayee years, I remember one of, uh, one of the prominent Indian officials, he said that everything under the sky you can have, short of self-determination. And this was rejected by a majority of Kashmiris because this is not what they're struggling for. Um, so it's not for anyone else to decide. It's not for India to decide, Pakistan to decide, anyone else to decide what Kashmiri should do and what resolution they should agree upon. Obviously, uh, it's for Kashmiris to decide and Kashmiris have decided and they have decided, they've written it in blood and sweat what they want. So every movement has phases and we are in that one phase right now. There's nothing wrong with having small goals that instead of fighting immediately for the broader goal of liberation, we can set small goals. But every Kashmiri will tell you that that is their aspiration, that that is what they want eventually. As for your uh, other question, that do I think that this is going to succeed? The thing is that I am compelled by my uh, personal life to believe and have faith that it's not going to succeed. Uh, because if I believed that the Indian state would succeed, that would be disastrous for me in terms of how I would look at my own life. So I was I would kind of conclude with a small personal note. I was sitting uh, a few months back and uh, I talked to my father only through letters. And he had sent a letter uh, through my uncle to me, which was basically his will his uh, last will, Basiyat, uh, as we say in our language. And when I saw it, I was shaken for a moment because I have not spent a day with him outside prison. And have you I ever met work. him, uh, Ahmed? In prison. Yeah, in prison. I met him. Uh, and I was holding in my hand his last will. And it almost feels like I, our life has not even started yet. Hope is not an option for Kashmiris. It's a necessity. You can't be sane and you can't function properly if you don't hope. Because if you tell a person that their entire lifetime was gone and it was consumed by a struggle and there's a possibility that that struggle might just fizzle out and the Indian state might actually succeed, that would create an existential crisis. Uh, for us, if we were to give up hope. So Kashmiris have not given up hope. Even if you speak about, when I speak to my mother, uh, when we are allowed the communication, every single time it feels like I'm the one who requires um, hope and she is the one who always gives me hope. She's the one who constantly tells me that it's all, it's all for a purpose, it's all for a meaning. So long as God is pleased with us, we are not at loss. Every Kashmir, if you speak to the family of any Kashmiri political prisoner, and there are thousands of them, they will tell you that sometimes the people who are outside are more despaired than the people who are inside. And you, you wouldn't blame them if they actually were despaired. But they're keeping their heads high. They are steadfast. And this is, and I would like to conclude by saying that the Indian state actually has uh, offered almost all of the Kashmiris in prison 
that the only thing they have to do is to sign what is called a bail bond that you have to sign, you have to accept that you won't talk, you won't criticize. You don't have to say anything in support of the state. And they have, have written that in silent. their own book. They have mentioned that in their own book. Yeah, in their own books, they mentioned that this is something that we have done. We, have we, we tried to bribe the strategy. leaders. Yeah, we were in contact. Uh, I mean, A.S. Dulat uh, uh, tells us uh, multiple times that we tried to bribe Kashmiri leaders and I was in close contact with them. And we, we yeah. did that. We, uh, yeah, I don't want to go in detail because uh, time is very short. Uh, thank you very much, Ahmed, for sharing this fascinating story of your parents. And one thing I would like to conclude at the end, that Indian state is actually, has actually failed in the last 75 years. Otherwise, if, if Kashmiris uh, were, uh, were for sale, they, 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 they would have annexed with India, if you see with 30, 30, 35 years of army rule, military rule, uh, army checkpoints on every corner, arbitrary detentions, uh, disappearances, extrajudicial killings, uh, disappearances. Kashmiris, Kashmiris would have uh, uh, surrendered if, 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 they, if they are for sale, but uh, Indian state has failed to do. What, what they wanted to do. And this will be the similar case if we see the Palestine and uh, the Israeli conflict. This is ongoing conflict and it will, it will definitely, if India is not ready to, uh, to compromise on its, uh, on, on its project of settler colonization, definitely it will go on and on and on. And uh, I mean, I really don't want to end the discussion, Ahmed, it's, it is so interesting to hear from you. Uh, but yeah, we have we have time constraints. So thank you very much for sharing all these things, different aspects of uh, the incarceration, arbitrary detention, the lawless laws, the medical treatment uh, that is denied, the legal rights that are being denied to Kashmiri prisoners, and then this discussion of settler colonization. And I really like the Patrick Wolf uh, uh, analysis of the colon and the comparison of colonization and settler colonization. It's really a very interesting story that we can uh, uh, we can uh, tell people uh, to distinguish what what is what's the difference between colonization and settler colonization. So thank you very much, and we will be in contact, inshallah, Ahmed. I would like to, I, I will try to write uh, inshallah on all this. And uh, so basically, justice for all for, for our audience. Uh, I will say that support justice for all. Support Ahmed Ben Qasim. Support Kashmiri prisoners. Support our JFA prisoners of conscience, our committed, our commitment to shedding light on these injustices and advocating for change remains steadfast. Through forums like Justice Talks, we strive to foster awareness, empathy, and global solidarity. Join us as we amplify the voices of those silenced and work towards an equitable world. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed bin Qasim. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.